Welcome and thank you all for joining us today for our online session on the impact of COVID-19 on the Agenda 2030. My name is Raida Mana and I am a member of the IAVE team. We hope you're safe and healthy during these disturbing times and always. As the coronavirus pandemic continues affecting our world, IAVE is committed to help volunteers and volunteer organizations deal with the challenges it presents. We have prepared a series of webinars and resources to help you best respond to this crisis, including the IAVE COVID-19 Response Fund to support volunteer-led preparedness, containment, response, and recovery activities. This fund will help ensure volunteering organizations have resources to keep critical volunteer efforts strong in these times of such great need. To learn more about how to donate to the fund or apply for a grant, please visit us at iave.org slash COVID-19 slash respond hash. IAVE strives to build an inclusive network open to individuals and organizations of all capacities and resources. Please visit us at iave.org slash join hash now to learn more and follow us on social media. The coronavirus pandemic has presented a series of challenges to the global volunteer community. However, despite the various obstacles, volunteers around the world are using this as an opportunity to come together in solidarity and turning the crisis into a catalyst to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Today, Lynn Wagner and Fei Leon of the International Institute for Sustainable Development will share their insights on how the pandemic will likely impact the SDGs and its implication on volunteer-led organizations around the world. A couple of important announcements as we start. This webinar is being recorded and will be available in our COVID-19 response website at iave.org slash COVID-19. For questions, please type them in the questions box and our moderator will convey them to our presenters. Let me start by introducing our moderator for today's session, David Styers. As the coordinator of the Volunteer Groups Alliance, a global coalition of organizations that contributes to sustainable development uh, through volunteering, David represents the voice of volunteers and volunteer organizations at the United Nations. In the past, he serves as the North America representative at IAVE's Board of Directors. David has an extensive history of nearly three decades working at the forefront of executive and civic engagement in leadership development, including senior roles at organizations like the Presidio Trust, BoardSOS, the Point of Light Foundation, and the Center for Volunteer and Nonprofit Leadership where he was responsible for developing and managing all the aspects of their consulting practice work. Currently, David serves as the Director for Learning and Leadership Programs at the League of American Orchestras in New York City. Thank you, David, for leading today's sessions and welcome everybody. Thank you so much, Raida. We look forward to having a um, wonderful conversation. We have nearly 200 people currently on the call. I will start with some opening statements just to give some general background and guidance um, for our conversation today and then introduce our speakers. As Raeda said, looking at this um, tremendous unprecedented situation that we're in now with coronavirus and particularly um, its impact on sustainable development goals. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers as we wrap up in an hour. So um, to get started, just want to give you a little bit of background about um, the volunteer um, stakeholder group at the United Nations. Um, as hopefully all of you know, the United Nations is celebrating its 75th anniversary this year. And it um, is really the membership group for all the countries in the world. So there's 193 member states that make up the United Nations. But in the 1990s, they decided they needed more voices at the table, particularly from civil society and business, besides just 
the national governments across the globe. And about seven years ago, volunteers were added as a specific stakeholder voice um, for the United Nations and were one of 18 of these uh, major groups and other stakeholders that represent the voices of civil society and business at the United Nations. And the Volunteer Groups Alliance was founded to serve as the focal point for that um, volunteer voice. And we have about 60 plus members across the globe that are um, part of the Volunteer Groups Alliance. If any of you would be interested in being engaged with us, feel free to be in touch with me. And I'm very excited to um, be able to serve as their um, coordinator and um, spokesperson here at the United Nations. Just to give you a brief overview about the Sustainable Development Goals, in case there's anyone who has not been familiar with these, they were adopted by the United Nations in um, 2015. And they're sort of, as we like to say, the to-do list for the world, um, and they were given a 15-year time frame for 2030 agenda of what we would like to see changed in the world in these 15 years. And so we're five years in and are beginning what's known as the decade of action because we're realizing we're behind on many of the goals, but we also realize that um, the current pandemic is adding even more strain to the achievement of these goals. So I would want to go quickly through the 17 just to give you a sense of what they cover, and then I'll turn it over to ISD to continue that conversation. So next slide, you'll see that the goals can be divided up into sort of um, five different groups. Um, one set are dealing with people, dealing with poverty and hunger and human dignity. And we recognize that the current pandemic can um, impact us around issues of loss of income, increasing poverty. We're seeing distribution um, disruptions of food production and um, distribution. We're seeing devastating health impact. Um, we're seeing closed schools and adequate remote learning. And certainly the stresses on women um, who are deemed some of the most essential of our employees um, in health care and other services and also thus most at risk. And so these are the people goals around, again, poverty, um, food, health, education, and gender. Then we'll go to the next set of goals, which are focused on the planet and how are we making sure that we have sustainable consumption and production, taking care of our natural resources, and climate change is a big issue of this. And certainly we're seeing um, issues again on clean water supply disruptions and the concern that one of the best ways to fight the virus is around washing hands, but not everyone has access to um, adequate supplies of fresh running water. Um, the one upside to everything is that we're actually seeing some um, reduced um, consumption and production that we're actually seeing less carbon footprint. And so our climate change actually is one of the only bright spots that may be happening right now. And there's some incredible pictures of major metropolitan cities. I saw ones of Los Angeles just yesterday about skies clearing up because there's not people driving and not as many airplanes in the sky. So um, it's one of the um, only bright spots really happening right now. So again, the planet goals around water, consumption, again, climate, and then life in the seas, and then life on land. And then the next set of goals, we look at prosperity. And these are the ones that are looking at energy and economy and how do we make sure that all people are prosperous with fulfilling lives. And again, we're seeing um, potential supply disruption with um, affordable and clean energy. Again, we see just yesterday the issues of oil supply and prices. Um, we see that um, certainly with employment, we're 
lower incomes or rapidly increased in unemployment. Um, there's great concerns of increased inequalities and potential crackdowns in certain countries. And then certainly the virus has had greater impact on places that had higher density and poor sanitation and still grave concerns about um, where it may go from here. And then there's um, two final goals to wrap it up. Goal 16 is around peace and how we live and adjust an inclusive society without violence and certainly um, in areas of conflict around the globe, we're certainly concerned about the great risk for people and refugees and people in war-torn areas. And um, Secretary General Gutierrez has called for a ceasefire globally just um, so that we can help get a handle on the pandemic in some way. And um, a lot of what the other 15 goals need is for goal 16 to be accomplished. It's hard to have any of the others without having um, peace as a part of it. And then finally, the last goal, number 17, is the partnership goal about how are we seeing this as truly a global agenda. All 193 member states ratified um, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and the 2030 Agenda. Um, and we're now still seeing backlashes against globalization, but the pandemic is certainly highlighting the need for international cooperation, particularly around public health. And so many of you may be very familiar with SDGs, but I just want to give you that quick overview and say that volunteers are a critical part because we see that there is no way these 17 goals can be effectively achieved without the incredible power of volunteers and volunteering in local communities and many um, volunteer engaging or involvement organizations that are um, critical to um, our work across the globe. So now I'd like to um, turn it over to our speakers and introduce um, IASD, the International Institute for Sustainable Development, celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. It was founded in 1990. It's been an award-winning think tank champion solutions to our planet's greatest challenges. Its vision is to see a balanced world where people and the planet thrive, and ISD really accelerates solutions that drive a global transition to fair economies, clean water, and stable climate. And we're so thrilled to have Two of their experts here, Lynn Wagner, their senior director of tracking progress of their work, and Say Leon, the senior policy advisor and editor of the SDG Knowledge Hub, which is a great resource of information. I enjoy getting their emails on a regular basis. So I will turn it over to Lynn and Say, and thank you so much for being with us today. And again, if you have any questions, please put those in the questions box and um, we'll have time to get those um, in a few minutes. So thank you, Lynn and Faye. Hi, thank you. And thank you for uh, inviting us to participate here. Um, I'm Lynn Wagner and Faye Leone is going to also be presenting on uh, the SDGs and um, COVID-19. Um, the, um, uh, I guess, so just uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And um, IISD is headquartered in Canada uh, with offices in a number of Canadian cities, uh, Geneva as well, and then a number of people who uh, work around the world. And so Faye and I are based in the US, uh, Faye particularly in, in the New York area. Um, and so, we're going to be bringing you our perspective uh, based on what we've been finding with the SDG Knowledge Hub uh, related to SDG implementation around the world. Um, and then Faye especially will be talking about what's happening um, in, in New York uh, where the intergovernmental um, oversight happens. Uh, so just, um, I, we're going to be talking, first of all, of what we expected would be happening in 2020 with regard to the SDGs, um, and 
that has all really been upended. Um, and so then what we're finding um, in uh, SDG implementation activities. Um, and then, as I said, Faye will go into a number of uh, aspects related to the annual global stock taking on SDG progress and thinking through how the SDGs still inform our work and can really be used to, to push forward uh, the, the progress that we want. Um, with this new focus really on uh, SDG3 as the linchpin, the, the um, human health key. Uh, so as we all know, um, 2020 has really been upended uh, by this pandemic. We started the year in January, uh, expecting to really focus on uh, these SDGs uh, 12, responsible consumption and production. There was a one of the targets had a 2020 date. Uh, most of the targets for the SDGs are supposed to be achieved by 2030. Uh, but a number of targets have a 2020 date, either because they were incorporating existing global goals that were meant to be achieved by 2020 and were going to be reviewed then. Uh, a number of goals have an earlier date also because they're seen as a prerequisite for achieving a number of other objectives. Uh, so, but so under 12, there was a goal, 12.4, um, to address uh, uh, sustainable uh, chemicals and waste management. And so there's an ongoing process that was supposed to come up with a new framework by the end of the year. Uh, likewise, under SDG 15, Life on Land, there are a number of biodiversity related targets that have 2020 dates uh, because they were incorporating the Aichi targets under the Convention on Biological Diversity. And so there's a negotiation process ongoing and uh, there was going to be a meeting in China in this coming October to uh, adopt a new framework for those uh, targets uh, related to biodiversity. Um, climate action was a key element. Countries were um, still are supposed to present their updated uh, nationally determined contributions related to the, the Paris Agreement on climate change. And um, also on life below water, on the ocean, there's a global conference that was going to take place to assess uh, and reinvigorate uh, commitments. So the, the SDGs are, really are a framework and they represent interlinkages between uh, the objectives that all of us are working on um, in different uh, sectors, different um, elements, different themes. Uh, and this is a framework that came out uh, really early in the SDG, um, after the SDGs were adopted. Uh, but I think it, it helps to think about the interlinkages be between the SDGs, that you can't take out that SDG 3, uh, Good Health, and expect the, the rest of society to function and to, to hold together. The, the education component is falling apart with uh, children not able to go to uh, school. The, um, you know, the, the um, aspects uh, related to um, strong communities, um, poverty is increasing as a result of the, the impacts of COVID. Um, at the base is the, the biosphere, the uh, biodiversity, uh, water, the ocean, um, and the, the relationship between society and the biosphere uh, needs to remain uh, intact. And if there's a, you know, a negative um, interaction between the two, then the, the relationships fall apart. Um, and so this, we'd say, shows that the, the SDG framework really is more important than ever the um, the interactions and using this systems approach to thinking about everything we do really is critical for for moving forward, uh, especially as we uh, move into the uh, thinking about the the recovery and the what after what comes after the um, the the pandemic has passed. The changes really need to adopt this systems approach. Uh, in our work on the SDG Knowledge Hub, uh, first of all, we were really um, seeing 
the the focus really was rightfully on the the health aspects um and um you know just uh, we really um express our deepest con condolences to anyone who is uh, suffering who has experienced loss with uh this current pandemic the um and that was uh clearly the, the, the immediate focus and, and is an ongoing focus. Uh, but soon after, we are seeing pieces um, picking up the, the importance of recognizing the marginalized groups that might be disproportionately affected or might be forgotten in addressing the pandemic. Um, that you know people with disabilities can't necessarily hear the messages coming from the government, from the, the uh, um, AIDS, from the groups that are telling them how to respond, where the options are to um, to get assistance, the um, you know, migrants and refugees, um, persons who are living in crowdly and densely populated areas are going to be affected in a different way than um, than the um, and and their needs really need to be kind of front and center as we um, address the, the challenges from the pandemic. Um, and so in many ways, the pandemic shows even more the importance of the principle underlying the 2030 agenda, which is no one left behind. Uh, that we aren't gonna get out of, um, out of the pandemic until everyone has you know, had the, the vaccination that uh, the, um, COVID-19 uh, is not um, continuing to, to fester and to, to thrive in any community um, anywhere in the world. Um, and that really illustrates the, the message behind the, the no one left behind um, principle underlying the 2030 agenda. And so then one final part that I wanted to mention before we get into to phase discussion of what's going on at the intergovernmental level is that the SDG framework provides entry points and levers for addressing the challenges that each of us are working on. Uh, on the, the right is the a framework that was put up or created by uh, UN uh, DESA um, talking about how the COVID pandemic affects each of the SDGs and what you can work on to address them. Um, and then going back to a report that came out last year on the global sustain the global sustainable development report, it identified uh, entry points to transformation uh, and levers for change. And I think that these entry points for transformation and levers for change remain just as relevant as when the report was uh, developed and launched last July, as as it is. Um, as it was then, um, and so thinking about how to to find an entry point into um, development um, using the SDG framework as a guide and incorporating in the systems approach to to you know focusing on your particular issue, which may be water and sanitation, may be um, sustainable cities, but keeping in mind. Um, the the importance of that system that you're trying to impact. Um, and so with that, I want to turn it over to, to Faye Leone, who's going to just uh, provide some updates from the intergovernmental level. Great. Thanks, Lynn. It's great to be with you all. I'm going to talk about some political processes being affected by COVID-19, and that is going to lead us straight into some specific needs for volunteer action. Um, so in normal times, as a lot of you know, the way the world looks at how governments are doing on the SDGs is to participate in a yearly checkup that the UN runs called the High Level Political Forum. Um, so what we're expecting for this year is what I wanted to share with you. We are hearing that the format is going to change dramatically. Um, the key messages are expected to change in response to what's going on. Um, but at the same time, the country specific attention to SDG implementation is hoped to go on largely as planned. Um, a few more details on each of these. So in-person meetings seem extremely unlikely, and one organizer I spoke with said it would take a miracle, um, and that's because of concerns of people outside New York about traveling here, 
and the situation people will be facing in their own countries around the world and the travel restrictions. But also, um, and this is something that I think we need to keep in mind for meetings in the short and medium term, is the need for social distancing at a meeting, um, even after the intensity of the crisis is abating perhaps, but having seating arrangements for hundreds of people in one space with adequate social distancing um, is going to require so much space and that could turn into more of a logistical challenge than we already had at the UN for space for large gatherings. So the HLPF organizers are working on a plan to have the meeting take place virtually. Um, and they're trying to figure out some technical complexities to do that. One is to translate the meeting uh, in real time into all six languages that the UN works in. And this may or may not be possible. So I wanted to flag that for you know groups who um, uh, may not be able to interact with the meeting as well in, um, in English only. And then depending on what format is possible, the discussion itself will have to adapt, how much interaction it can have, how much time people can sit and follow along from afar. So these are all still to be answered. Um, and having the HLPF take place without an actual human gathering is really different in one way above all, which is that usually at the HLPF, civil society is there in force. These are groups reporting as many of you know, on ocean health, disability rights, women's issues in their countries. People are launching projects and forging collaborations. Um, they get together for laboratory type workshops to learn about making change in their countries. And there's usually hundreds of side events, um, many of which are organized and presented by volunteer organizations and NGOs. So if you may have seen this month, the UN did put out a call for applications for groups around the world to request a spot to host a side event in July. Um, but at the same time, we know and they acknowledge that plans may not go forward that way. Another important and really lively piece of the HLPF each year is what's called the Voluntary National Reviews or the VNRs. And this is when a few dozen countries um, each year offer to provide an update on how the SDGs are progressing in their countries. And this year, 51 countries had signed up to present this July. And we've heard that all of them are eager to continue um, and find a way to present, and the UN plans to find a way for them to present to each other. Um, at the same time, the organizers sort of stressed when they were giving me this update that the in-country work is the most important part of the VNR process. Um, and I think we think that's true. Governments consult with stakeholders um, to get their views on how they're doing. They connect departments and ministries within the government, and they, they really do reflect on what's been learned about achieving the SDGs in our countries um, and where they still need to make more changes. So nobody wants those the countries to slow down on those processes um, in preparation for the VNR, even though they are fighting COVID at the same time. So the organizers said they're gonna wait for the deadline for countries to submit the first parts of their report. These are called the main messages and that deadline actually happens to be today. So we think that they will put out some sort of update um, on how virtual meetings will proceed pretty shortly. And then lastly on pieces of the HLPF, the status of each one for this year, um, the written declaration that governments work on ahead of time this is still going forward. Um, delegations in New York are exchanging ideas in writing, even though they can't meet in person. And this week there is a plan to share an outline of the declaration to be adopted in July. And then they will hold a virtual meeting to discuss it and release the first draft in early May. What will the declaration say this year? Um, it will most likely try to highlight the consequences of COVID-19 and what the challenges it for the coming year and also include a call to stay on track with the 2030 agenda and the SDGs. So in sum, the HLPF is a reporting mechanism and that reporting is still going forward and, and must still go forward. There are extra challenges this year, um, but in our view, volunteer organizations around the world can help make sure it's still a strong reporting process. So on to the next slide. Um, this is, quite a long quote, but the idea is that, so the HLPF has run its review process that I just discussed for four years now, since the SDGs began in 2016. 
So it is now due for review itself. Um, governments and stakeholders want to take a step back and make some improvements on that stock taking process. Um, so their, con their discussions on this started off in February, but what we're hearing is that they want to scale it down now to deal with just the immediate details that have to be figured out for 2021. So if there will be specific SDGs in focus at the 2021 session or a more general theme for that session, but put off any big thinking until after the crisis phase has passed. So this is a proposal from the governments that are leading that discussion. And those are the, the missions of Benin and Georgia in New York. Um, so I wanted to share this with you to point out that it's not just individual meetings and negotiations that are being rearranged. It's, it's reflective of a feeling that the actual structure that we use to monitor sustainable development may need to adapt to this crisis. And to me, that's actually a hopeful sign um, that there's political interest among governments in making sure that our tools are up to their tasks, um, rather than just saying, let's go back to how things were done. So that's where we are at the intergovernmental level in New York. <clears throat> um, and then the next slide begins some ideas on uh, what volunteers can do. Um, and it's countless, as you all know, um, but we've identified four types of volunteer action and voice. And I imagine that volunteers and volunteer organizations are feeling a burden right now of when have we been needed more than now. Um, but the, I think these four actions can have a really powerful effect. So the first is direct service. And we've heard a couple of examples of these already. You know what you all are doing. Um, maybe it is really specific to containing the virus or meeting people's needs during lockdown times. Um, maybe you're no longer even in the community where you are working and you're trying to transfer your projects to those who still are. Or maybe you're trying to keep the work going on other issues, like keeping plastic pollution down while people increase their use of disposables to protect their health. Um, whatever a volunteer organization is doing, our suggestion is to keep in mind the entire SDG framework and the linkages with health and inequalities um, and every other issue, and then keep highlighting all the other actions needed to leave no one behind. Um, impact two. So for IISD, um, transparency and accountability are the first steps to making change. And so the more attention on government's responses to the pandemic, the better. Um, a really impo important focus at this stage of the crisis in terms of policy is the design of stimulus packages. And that's just about the most basic question of what kind of consumption do we want to stimulate? What markets do we want to protect? Um, and I think that we should all be speaking out in the answer to this question. How do we protect food supply chains? What ecosystem impacts are going to prevent another crisis like this? Um, what kind of energy does this new does, does a new infrastructure use, um, perhaps that is being built to deal with coronavirus? And are we locking that infrastructure into fossil fuel use for years to come? So volunteers can add important information and insights on how each proposed response to the pandemic will affect their community or issue. How would stimulus measures impact your organization volunteer organizations should let raise the alarm if resources are getting directed away from their work because it may because their work may not be seen as directly related um but we know we can't lose any piece of our puzzle and so it's really fantastic that ayave has set up the covid 19 response fund um and our ISD colleague, um, her name is Oshani Pereira, she wrote an article on this. And she writes, in the long run, stimulus spending will only make a difference if sustainable development is put front and center. So as economic activity comes back, let's protect human health by managing nature better. Um, and lastly, um, on this point, it's just related to making sure everyone's voices can continue to be heard, um, even as meetings get postponed or are converted to virtual format. How can we make sure not to have diverse views lost in that process? And I'm going to come back to that on, on point number four. So on knowledge, I, I just want, I feel that even if nothing good 
comes out of this terrible situation, it is a massive learning opportunity. Um, and volunteers are in a really great place of, out of everyone to gather knowledge that will be relevant again and again. And that can add up to greater resilience from all crises. So can every organization track what their, their location, their group, their sector is experiencing? Um, if there's a shortage of doctors with a specific expertise, that could be a problem again when climate change exacerbates health threats, um, wildfires and their related respiratory effects, for example. Sanitation challenges make it harder to stop the spread of the virus and strengthening that system has countless other benefits. David mentioned this earlier. Forecasts for Europe in summer 2019 see a repeat of severe heat waves. How does that overlap with people who are locked down in their homes but don't have indoor cooling? So can we use data from practices happening now to prepare? Um, so where are the weaknesses? This is a, an important area of knowledge right now and because these could be the same things that crack in the next crisis. And, we can look at this as a global stress test. To me, and, and again, I'm in the New York area, but one test that's giving some very interesting results is cooperation across subnational governments. So when national leadership fails, subnational leaders can create new collaborative structures. And I think we could expect those to be used again in the future for other crises that cross local borders. And then fourth, um, fourth impact for volunteers and civil society is voice in virtual meetings. Some of you may be wondering, will civil society have access to the HLPF if it's all virtual? And what about when meetings get postponed? How do we deal with that potential loss of momentum? So first on postponement, um, an example that comes to mind where there could be a silver lining is about the two gender equality forums that were planned for May and July in Mexico City and Paris. Um, the purpose was to get NGOs to recommend actions um, to finally live up to the, the Beijing Program of Action on, on Gender Equality 25 years after its adoption. But um, women from developing countries ended up writing an open letter to the organizers of those forums saying, we're, we're not being included in this, in this preparation process. You're not hearing from us. Um, and that's part of, that's partly due to lack of information, awareness, funding, capacity, access to internet, and language restrictions. So I think these should all be sort of flashing lights to us about making sure that virtual meetings will be um, participatory in the future. And now with the postponement, there's time to advocate for that and to find solutions to include more, more voices. Um, on the climate change side, it was definitely disappointing that the next conference um, had to be postponed, but some of our climate experts are actually arguing that it gives more time to reach breakthroughs on the toughest issues in the Paris Agreement. So, okay, that's postponements. Now, when the meetings arrive um, and they're switched to online formats, what does that mean for civil society and volunteer groups around the world? Well, there's a chance it could help um, groups who normally feel too distant from preparatory conversations. They're now actually at the same distance as everyone else. And so one example, and this is leading up to July, the UN Secretariat's running a series of virtual consultations to gather input, and they want to hear from stakeholders um, on six, six um, topics, starting with human well-being. These are the six topics that were highlighted by scientists in the GSDR that Lynn put, um, mentioned earlier. But to use this possibility of the virtual comfort, um, consultations, it does seem that some groups might need to form new partnerships and collaborate to make sure everyone has digital access. And also um, back to the translation issue, the consultations are taking place in English only. So I think language barriers are emerging as a real challenge as, as work goes virtual. Um, a couple of civil society campaigns that look at improving the UN, and this is also in the lead up to the 75th anniversary that David spoke about. Um, these campaigns have come together to call for a big change in how stakeholders are permitted to contribute um, in UN processes and to give a bit more legitimacy, um, more access, and, and more power overall. And in making this push, these groups are pointing to changes in communication technology that it, it makes it possible for a fairer and more democratic approach. So this is a call that perhaps more vol volunteer organizations want to join. Um, as the trend grows toward more meeting innovations. Um, so just to recap, and I'm ending, um, 
everyone needs to identify their relation to SDG3 right now on health, right? Maybe that's the pandemic response, other kind of direct action, but also in linking your expertise to the design of stimulus packages, making sure those are well-informed, working for accountability by governments as they design and carry out those responses. Um, documenting and sharing the impacts of local communities is another crucial role. And then what venue to use to report those? Are they further into the future? And this means you can organize better in the meantime, or are they happening virtually? And can groups that lack, that lack access to technology be paired with those more digitally privileged, so to speak, so more people can participate? And the HLPF is a gathering of governments from all countries, ultimately. So don't hesitate to work with governments, reach out and participate in the VNRs taking place this year for 51 countries and next year. Another nine governments are already signed up for 2021, by the way. Um, the VNRs really do live at the country level. So the pressure is definitely on for everyone to take action. I know we all feel it. Um, volunteers probably feel it more deeply than anyone. Um, we hope that this has helped a bit to lend some shape to all that potential and power. And we'd love to share any further resources that might be useful. And we'd love to hear your thoughts or questions now. Great. Thank you so much, Lynn and Say. Um, one question that's come in is that in view of COVID-19, is there a need for recalibration of the sustainable development goals and targets, um, particularly on like the people's goals, the social side, and the peace goals? Um, and if yes, what could be a reasonable roadmap for doing that? So, I mean, that, that is a really interesting question. Uh, and I think um, just right now, I guess the the roadmap for replacing the the 2020 targets um, and incorporating them into the the uh, SEG framework isn't quite clear. First, we have to see what those new 2020 uh, the targets with 2020 dates might look like. Um, there's, I think, generally a a reluctance to open up the SDG framework um, to change it, but that's all I think kind of pre-COVID. Um, and as Faye's uh, slide talking about the the rethinking the structures shows, there there is a recognition that everything is changing. Um, but I I really do think that the 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 SDG framework is um, is still very, um, I think, strong and useful in thinking about how uh, how to incorporate the you know 17 um, objectives, um, which is uh, it, it doesn't represent everything in the uh, the natural system, but it it is um, a really robust framework for thinking about how things interact. Um, certainly, we're needing to um, focus particularly on SDG3 a lot more than people thought. And maybe within that, you know, there are, there are addi additional elements um, other than the targets that were under it. Um, I, you know, I don't know if it would be a, an official um, change to the SDG framework or just new emphasis that we'll be seeing coming out of this. Great, thank you. And from your perspective, what is the framework or approach you would recommend to governance or voluntary organizations when it comes to engaging volunteers doing direct service del delivery at this time of COVID-19, particularly to avoid doing more harm? Um, well, I think, I mean, the, you know, this, I think as Faye wrapped up and talked about the need to keep in mind all 17 goals, um, but, you know, as we're implement, implementing uh, this framework, implementing uh, sustainable development, we certainly, you know, you do dig in, um, enter it from a particular perspective or a particular objective, which often is, you know, just one or two goals. Um, and so certainly, you know, still find that entry point, find what works best, uh, what what the particular needs of of the community you're working with are, 
Um, but as you're addressing them, you keep in mind what the other um, elements of the SDG framework would, would point to as the, the interacting um, either positive or negative um, elements to, to keep in mind. Um, so that as you're uh, you know, digging into one aspect, you can start seeing the connections um, and addressing the connections uh, from there. Another question, do you think that it's a good idea would be that policy should from now on be focused on health, you know, thinking of health as physical, psychological, and social well-being, so therefore equating well-being and sustainability with health. What do you think about this idea for a future for more sustainable policy framework? Um. But certainly, the, a more holistic view um, is is necessary, and I think this um, pandemic is showing us that. Um, and you do want to, you know, dig into that. I think the um, and you know the health aspect of um, of achieving sustainable development is really. Um, being elevated and you know the importance of addressing it uh, is is becoming more important. Um, but you don't. I think the SDG framework shows us we don't want to um, you know exclusively focus on um, that. You need to keep in in mind the other elements. Um, you know, just to to achieve the the health goals we need to have a good source of electricity in our hospitals we need to have um you know up and coming um doctors who are being educated well um we need to have cities that are functioning um we need to have the good governance piece um and so you know you could use health as that entry point certainly and it's um it's very important but um you you want to keep in mind uh, the the that the other elements are underlying and helping to hold up your achievements on health. Great. And for ISD, um, do you have a plan to do an assessment of the impact of volunteering for SDGs during this COVID nineteen pandemic? And sort of as a follow up, do you know right now what your future research plans may be and how they have changed based on the pandemic? That's that's a great question. I guess we we don't have a specific uh, research line on uh, the role of volunteers. Um, if there are any reports that come out of this, uh, please direct them our way so we can include them on the SDG Knowledge Hub. Um, but um, that's I guess some of the elements that other um, parts of ISD are working on. Um, are looking specifically at the different um, stimulus packages and how well they're incorporating um, a variety of sustainable development concerns into them. Um, and so I guess we aren't looking maybe right at the um, the, the the grassroots uh, volunteer level, um, but uh, slightly higher up level. Um, but um, you know, please, if you come across uh, reports, direct them our way, and we'd be happy to include them on the SDG Knowledge Hub. Great, thank you. Um, a little bit more specific, um, how do you think that the COVID-19 crisis could be used as an opportunity to redesign like resilient food systems at the local level? Or any other things that need to be redesigned? particularly taking it from the national to local communities. Right. And how local communities can be more involved in the process of planning and, and redesigning. I think we have an article from a colleague at ISD on this, on, on stimulating food supply, food supply chains. I'll put it in the chat box. Okay, great. Do you have a sense of how the UN envisions engaging um, not only with the civil society, the social sector, but also the private sector and a long-term strategy to deal with the aftermath of COVID-19. They have, the private sector has a really big, 
profile and seems to grow every year at the HLPF. And they look toward it more and more, from what I can tell, as a way to get out a platform um, for what they're doing that supports sustainability and to what extent that's earnest and measurable and their contributions are overall pot you know net net positive um, I think that's up to all of us to to hold them accountable and really watch carefully what they say and how they deliver um, I would say that's an important piece to not get lost if if meetings don't take place in person this year because private sector were one of the major sources of interest on the sidelines. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, David. I, mean, I think it may be a little bit too soon to know what that may be. And what do you think we need to do after the COVID-19 pandemic situation is over to keep in pace with the sustainable development movement? Um, you know, we've been gaining a huge amount of support around the world, but after this lockdown or restrictions, you know, many countries' main focus may become more profit and economic gain mm -hmm. um, that's been halted by COVID-19. Um, don't you think that this economy plunge and getting back to where they were will diminish uh, many of the change maker efforts around sustainable development? I do think we should look out for that. Um, and I think that's what a lot of the thinking and research um, is right now with relation to the stimulus packages is not going back to the economy that we had that in which humans and nature were such a threat to each other, um, but the other way around. And I think the more, the more everyone can help to call for to, to put specifics to what we're willing to change in our lives, the better. We're willing to change our consumption habits. We're willing to change which industries we subsidize or, or don't. Um, so I think let's just keep brainstorming collectively and every group can tie it really specifically to their, their communities, their locations, their issues and sectors and say, this is how this group will be affected and everything is connected as we've now learned if we didn't know it before. So um, I know we have lots more questions and we'll have time in the next um, um, three minutes. Um, we'll do a final question from someone who has worked on SDGs in developing country context. The concern is the same as before. Now, especially achieving SDGs will be on the back burner as governments scramble to save lives and livelihoods. In this process, it will be so difficult to continue the momentum on the SDGs like climate change, especially at the grassroots level. I've witnessed firsthand the varying priorities of government. What would be the recommendation on keeping government engagement and ensuring it trickles down at grassroots level? Um, depends on the context, I am sure, but I would think the more sort of joining hands with the messages, the better. So if, if groups can form coalitions around single messages or sets of issues, that may amplify the message. Um, and I also think that knowledge collection and documenting what's going on and putting that out with some numbers behind it show some impacts of positive and negative measures that governments take um, and link those to what caused the problem that we're in now. So both uh, joining up with others in collaboration and bringing some, some numbers and some facts from what you're observing. No, absolutely. And this will be ongoing work um, for days, weeks, months, and even years to come to continue to deal with how do we continue towards our 2030 agenda with this very unexpected um, impact of this pandemic here in year five. I want to thank our two presenters, Faye and Lynn, and turn it back over to our organizer, Raida, for final words from Ayave. Thank you, um, David, Faye, and Lynn. It was a very insightful conversation and, and a very good uh, perspective of how um, the SDGs, its implementation and its connection to volunteering will be impacted. Thank you everybody for your very insightful questions. We will be sharing the recording of this webinar with all of you via email. 
We will also be uploading the recording to our COVID-19 respond, um, respond uh, website, iava.org slash COVID-19. In there, you can also find more information about our respond fund, both to support it and to apply for grants. Um, please join us. This is a network that is made of organization and individuals that support volunteering in all of its forms. And we would love to have you with us and as part of us. Do review our social media where we'll be uploading more um, upcoming sessions. And thank you all for being here. Stay safe. Thank you, Arita. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of the week. Thank you, everyone. Same to you.